Welcome back everybody. Let's pray. Amen. <clears throat> We've looked at Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. We then went through Jeremiah chapter 4, Colossians chapter 2, Acts chapter 7. And I then spent some time explaining in a really simplified and shortened fashion how I understand the process of salvation to work when we consider the work of justification, sanctification and we didn't address the issue of glorification. We've already spoken at the very beginning of our series and I don't want us to forget this point that the first plus the second message was the third, if you remember. Adam White said this was the message and this was the repeat of that same message. So I don't want us to forget that point because it's important for us to understand this when we consider the work of the everlasting gospel. And I don't normally like to jump ahead but I'm just going to do that now. If you turn to page 10, we're in Christ Object Lessons, page 122, paragraph 2. It's t subtitled, The Wheat and the Tears Continued. Now Matthew 13, as you know, talks about the parable of this field with wheat and tears. And in the passage... Verse 28, that we've already read, it's, it's in your notes. Um, let's just find it if we can on page 7. On page 7, we read verse 28. It said, the householder said, He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. Let me see that, an enemy hath done this. When you've got the wheat and the tears in the field, he says an enemy put the tears into the field. It wasn't the work of God. In the same chapter, there's another parable that's brought to view, which is the parable of a net that's cast into the sea. And when this net gathers in the fish, it's going to talk about gathering good and bad fish all at the same time. And then it drags this net to the seashore. And then there's this separation process. It's the same imagery that's being brought to view that we've discussed. But here it gives the mission, the gospel mission, in the terms of this net. So we're in Christ Object Lessons 122, paragraph 2. Page 10. The casting of the net is the preaching of the gospel. This gathers both good and evil into the church. So in Matthew 13, the parable of the field, it says that an enemy put these tears in. But here, talking about the same dynamics, the same process, the same situation, it says that it's, it's unavoidable that when the gospel is given these bad fish, or it says these evil, the evil are going to come into the church. It's, it's part of the dynamics of the giving of the gospel. There's no way of avoiding this when we think about this good and evil. I just want us to think about this a little bit. These are prophetic studies, and, and rightly or wrongly, we tend to avoid going into, say, the epistles and start ploughing through those epistles of Paul in a moralistic way because we have a focused message to give. But if you go to Romans chapter 6, don't turn there, but Romans chapter 6 deals with the issue or the subject of baptism. And Paul is absolutely clear 
that a person needs to be converted before they're baptised. Ellen White uses a term that many people in the church are buried alive when talking about baptism and she talks at quite some length about the stringent um, requirements or the high hurdle of entrance into the church of God. And what I mean by that is she explains it in this way, that before someone gets baptised and uh, comes into the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God on this earth is the church, it's the Seventh-day Adventist church, so we are clear about that, that they need to know what they're getting into. And not only do they know to need to know to what they're getting into, so they need to have an intellectual understanding of the dynamics of what it means to be a church member, but they also need to have a spiritual experience, they need to have experienced conversion. And not only do they need to have experienced it, you need to have seen it in their lives. Else you cannot see whether, they're not, whether or not they're fit candidates for baptism. So the signs of conversion or the fruit of conversion is something that you can see. Now we do not know what's in the heart of a person. So there can be a person who fakes it all the way through, gives this impression of being converted, and they, as we say you know, in the English, they slip through the net, but in the context of this thing, they didn't slip through the net, they actually got caught up in the net. There was this evil people that entered the church. Now if you understand and, and are comfortable with that concept of entrance into the church and baptism, then you know that someone who's doing open sin, and we read that earlier, someone who you see doing sin cannot be baptised. And if you cannot be baptised, you cannot be a church member. So the only people that are going to come into the church are the people who are not doing sin. We're not dealing with the motivation of the heart of why they're there. We're talking about their actions when we talk about sin. And this is why I said, when from 9-11 you have these two groups, the wise and the foolish, that these people are not doing open sin because they would never have had entrance into the church to begin with. These are dealing with church members and if they were open sinners, they should be disciplined or this fellowship, depending on what the issue is, they should be out of the church as Ellen White says, if they hadn't joined the church, they should have never been allowed entrance into the church. So this race is, for the wise and the foolish, is about people who are professing Christians. If you read the parable of the ten virgins in Christ Object Lessons, and we haven't, I haven't got the passage in your notes, but if you were to read it, and you put the distinguishing marks between the wise and the foolish, what's the difference between them? There virtually isn't. They look the same, they eat the same, they dress the same, they have the same desire, they have the same um, uh, focus, they do the same. There's, there's hardly any difference between them. The thing that's dr that, that is the difference between them is there's something in the heart that isn't being addressed with, with the foolish, that's being addressed with by the wise. So in this passage here, when it says it gath gathers both good and evil into the church, you must understand that this word evil is not talking about someone who is practicing sin. Because if they were practicing sin, the net would never have gathered them into the church. Because we don't have a culture in our church where we deal with baptismal candidates in this fashion, in this rigid way, the, you know, the floodgate is open and almost anybody can come in. People get baptised who we know nothing about, you go to a, a camp meeting and we baptise children even, you know, without knowing anything about their background and their commitment to Christ. So the whole way we process or deal with baptisms is, is wrong in many ways and because it's endemic in our church, we, we've come on, we're now at the end of the world and we have a misconception of of the rules and regulations that surround baptism. That's what I want to say. When you do realise how it's supposed to function, then you would know that this term evil here is not talking about people who are practising sin. So when we talk about the wise and the foolish, or in uh, Daniel chapter 10 it talks about the wise and the wicked, these wicked people, these tares, are not open sinners. 
So we need to keep that clear in our mind. So when we're dealing with this issue of sin, this is not liberty to think that you can be sinning in this time period, because if you are, you're not, and the way I express it, you're not even in the race to arrive at this goal if you're committing sin. These tears are not living in that fashion. Then she goes on to say, when the mission of the gospel is completed. I just want to stop there. I've gone into this third section of this paragraph. It says, when the mission of the gospel. So we want to ask ourselves, what is the mission of the gospel? Now, when we talk about the gospel, the everlasting gospel, we always talk about it in three steps, like this. One plus two plus three equals the everlasting gospel. And that is correct. I'm not trying to undo any of that, but you have to factor this concept with this concept. That you have to deal with both of these at the same time. Often there are spiritual concepts, principles, ideas that seem to be in conflict one with the other. This is not the only place. It happens in, in, other, in other areas when we think about theology or the doctrines that we believe as Christians and this is one of them the everlasting gospel is three steps absolutely clear but the third step is just a repetition of the first and second and the first and second are themselves just a singular message this passage is going to teach us the following the gospel is the first and second step. The gospel is the first and second step. So what is the third? What is the third then? The third is the exhibition or the demonstration of the gospel. It's not the development of the gospel. Some people are under a misconception when we talk about the everlasting gospel being three steps, that this is a developmental process from one to two to three. And the reason we know it's not is not only from what, we've going to, what we're going to read, but what we've already read, that this is the conclusion or the repeat of what's already happened. And when we said it was the repeat of the message, when we come to this, not doing evangelism in the city, which was the context of the 1909 passages that we read at the beginning of our series, but on a personal level, it's talking about the first and the second angel's messages are the gospel message, period. But the third is an exhibition or a demonstration of the gospel and it's not a continual, defini- uh, sorry, continual development of the gospel in the sense that you go from the first to the second to the third. The first and the second complete the gospel work in the, in the life of a human being. You don't go on to the third as some kind of finishing touch. The third is not some kind of finishing touch. The third is a demonstration of what has already happened in a person's life. So we're going to read that in this statement. When the mission of the gospel is completed. So we understand what completed means. It means finished. So the question we want to ask ourselves. Here's one, two and three. When when was it finished? She's going to define this now. She says when it is finished, comma, in your notes, I'm going to slip in the word then. When the mission of the gospel is completed, comma, my word, then the judgment will accomplish the work of separation. So first you have to complete the gospel and then the judgment will do the work of separation. So the third step of the gospel, if you like, is not the third step in some kind of developmental process, it's a separation. And she says it clearly, when the gospel is finished, right here, it got completed. It completed at the end of the second, and then the judgment, the third step, will accomplish the work of separation. You can't have the gospel going on through during the time of the harvest. 
Because the definition of harvest is what? According to Hosea 10.12, it means to cut something short. Here's the cutting. You cut the work of the second angel, which was the work of growth or development or righteousness. And when it got cut, that was the harvest. That's the work of separation. So I hope we can see that clearly. This is not a new concept in Christ Object Lessons 20, 122. It's the repeating theme of what, we, what I presented at the very beginning. So we're now just developing this idea and consolidating it in a way that hopefully you can see what people might express, the practical application of it. I'm never sure about what it means when people say, can you make this practical? But if this is what you think practical is, then, then that's what I'm doing. The wise and the foolish are not committing sin. The wicked, in Daniel 12, in this passage, the tears are not people who are doing open sin. There's something different about these tears. But the work of the gospel gets completed at the end of the second step, before you get to the third, and the third is not a development of the gospel, it's an exhibition of what already happened in the first and second. And that's why we can confidently say that the third is a repeat of the second. It's just another way of expressing this same thought. Now if that's the case, then you know if this is our line and I'm marking this is the third. And I could have marked the Sunday law as the third if, that's, if you're more comfortable with that. We're here. Here's the Sunday law, the third. This point here, before you get to the third, before the wheat and the tears are separated, first the tears, then the wheat, there's a separation process, the harvest. We read the end of the test, end of probation. The reapers begin to do their work. The man with the ink horn signifies who is God and who isn't. It's completed here. This, the first and second angel's messages, is the work or the mission of the gospel. This, demonstra- this development of the gospel occurs here, and then you just demonstrate what has already happened in this experience. So when you conceptualise what this means, if you're waiting for an experience at the third step to do something that wasn't accomplished in this period, it's a delusion. It's a mistake in the concept of how the everlasting gospel works. She says here, I'll say it again because it's such an important thing for us to understand. Christ Object Lessons 122, paragraph 2. When the mission of the gospel is completed, then the work of separation, then the judgment will accomplish the work. This is the work of separation once it's complete. The first and second angel's messages is the gospel and this is the demonstration that a person has received the gospel. So if you want to put sin out of your life, this is why Ellen White says you cannot wait till the end when you have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to accomplish that work. It has to be done here. So let's go back to Amos chapter 9 verses 9 to 15. Um, Well, if we get time, we'll go back and um, read the rest of that passage from Christ Object Lessons and the following paragraphs. But I want you just to make sure that we understand this issue about what the Gospel is. It's completed, then the judgment. The work of justification and sanctification is the work of the Gospel. All that the third does It just cuts short the work of righteousness and it gathers in the harvest. This is the harvest time period, which is why it's part of the whole cycle of the gospel, but it's a demonstration, not a development. Hopefully, we've at least seen the idea, even if you haven't accepted it and and are comfortable with it. Before we read Amos chapter 9, I want to just develop this idea about these two steps, these two stages in Adventism. Where do we get this concept from? Did we make it up? Um, Because on the surface all you can see is two steps, two temple cleansings, first the church, then the world. First 
Protestant America, then the Millerites. Two steps, Christ only cleaned the temple twice. So how do we say when we come to Adventism there are two steps? There are various ways to approach this problem, but perhaps the clearest way is to think about it in the following. This is Adventism, and this is the world. The world is going to be harvested. The end of the world, there's going to be a harvest, and then there's going to be destruction, punishment. But obviously, Adventism also has to be harvested. So, I'll just put it here, at the end of Adventism, there is also to be a harvest. Now, is is there a difference between this harvest and this one? At one level, no, because it's just one continual harvest. We don't have time to go through the Bible passages, but many of us are familiar with the concepts behind this. It's the concept of first fruit. Now, above all the people on the earth, even if you don't understand the sanctuary system or the feasts well, most of us are familiar with these terms as Adventists. This issue about the first fruits. So what happens is, there's a field that's going to be harvested. And before you're allowed to touch that field and harvest it for your own purposes, what you're supposed to do is thank God for giving you this harvest. And the way you should do that, or show your appreciation, is you go through this field and you take the first few sheaves, you cut them off here, you take the first few, the ones that are ripened first, You gather them together into a bundle. So here we've gathered them into a bundle. You bind them together, but there are only a few of them. You've got thousands of sheaves in this field. Here's thousands of them. And you've only got a few here. You gather the first fruits, the ones that are first ripened, and on a specific day in the calendar of uh, the Jewish economy, after cutting them down, you take them, and you lift them up and you offer them to God in recognition of this great harvest or this blessing that he's given to you. This is the symbol of the first fruits. I think we're reasonably familiar with this concept, this idea. So, we teach, we understand that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the first things that are going to be reaped and then the world will be reaped. In the scale of things, I don't know how many of us there are, but there's 14 to 18 million and there's 7 to 8 billion people in the world. Now in the scale of this, there's only a few of us and there's many people in the world. And besides the fact that most of this 18 million aren't even going to be saved, it's only going to be a remnant, you know that when the harvest of the Adventism happens, it's only going to be a very few people. And secondly, the Lord has to get his people ready first because they're going to give a loud cry to the world. So these people have to be harvested first. So you have this harvest one and this harvest two. And this model of harvest one and harvest two is taken right from this concept. Harvest one and harvest two. This is the first fruit. The ones that get ripened and ready first. These ones are offered to God. And not only are they offered, they're lifted up. Now at the moment, the world cannot really see us. You know, we're just a, a little speck in the dust of, on the world map or the world's view of what's going on. But as Adventists are going to be lifted up, the Bible says they're going to be lifted up as a flag, or we, the terminology that it uses is an ensign. Now an ensign is a flag, and that flag isn't any old flag. This is a battle flag, or a banner. This is the banner, or the flag that an army uses to identify itself to its enemies. So as this banner, or a battle flag, is lifted up or raised up, it's the same symbology of these first fruit that are lifted up. And when these are lifted up in honour to God, God says, this fruit is ready. 
Once these have been offered to me, the harvest of Adventism, then you can reap the world. So this is the first harvest followed by the second harvest. This is the first fruit offering and then the harvest. When you see this concept for what it is, this prophetic symbology that's brought to view here, but you go back into New Testament history in the time of Christ, what you noticed is the following. Before I go that, let me get one step back. Do you remember Brother Patrick said at Pentecost you get the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? But he said 50 days before this, on the day of uh, Christ's resurrection, there was a sprinkling. I mentioned this earlier as well. This is all, all of this is the former rain. But the former rain occurs in two steps. Step one, step two. This two-step process is the recurring theme. And when we think about these first fruits in this history, we're going to find the same thing. Did you know when Christ was crucified, he identifies himself as the first fruit. He needs to be lifted up to God and he gets lifted up on the cross. When he gets raised up between heaven and earth, he is now this first fruit offering and he says, now I am the first fruit, therefore we can finish off this great controversy because I'm the beginning of the harvest and there's going to be a worldwide harvest after me. But when he was the first fruit, you remember, hopefully, that when he was on the cross, there was not only darkness, but there was an earthquake. Now, during that earthquake, there were many graves in Jerusalem, and the graves, the way they do graves is they don't bury people in the ground. People are buried above ground in al mostly alabaster boxes or coffins. And some of these coffins during the uh, earthquake got shaken and broken, and the bodies of men were exposed. Some of these men who were righteous men were resurrected with Christ on the Sunday. So you've got two groups of people who have been resurrected. You've got Christ who's resurrected on that Sunday and you've got those men who are also resurrected. I think they resurrected on a Sunday. Don't hold me to that because it, they may have been before. It was, I think it was on a Sunday. Um, I wasn't sure if it was on the day before, but I think it's on Sunday because they rest with him. It's, it's included in the passage, the description, it's included in the passage that was written about the Friday, but it was, it, it said that they, were, that they rose and they travelled, they mingled with the people in Jerusalem on the Sunday. Yeah, I think it was on the Sunday, but my, well, my brother's confirming that, so we're going to go with that, they, that they're resurrected on Sunday, they rest on the Sabbath. But the point I want to make is that they're resurrected as well. And Christ calls those men the first fruit of humanity as well. So in the history of Christ, you've got two first fruit offerings. So there's one, and I'm going to do the other one as a singular first fruit. This is Christ, and this is men. So here's these two first fruits, a singular one, then a group. So when we think about first fruits, we want to think about it in the concept of being two groups of people. And I've said that this first fruit offering is a harvest of Adventism. So I'm already beginning to introduce this idea that the harvesting of Adventism is identifying two groups of people. Because the first fruit is in two groups. I mentioned Resurrection Day and Pentecost, so jump forward 50 days. This harvest that we're speaking about here, all of this that we've just spoken about, at the beginning of the year is barley. 50 days later, you get another harvest, which is wheat. You get a barley harvest and a wheat harvest. Now at the wheat harvest, they're going to offer another first fruit before the Lord. And when they offer this first fruit, it's not going to be Christ that's going to be represented here because he's already died and resurrected. What's being brought to view here is they get the wheat and they grind it up. It's not virgin wheat stalks like it was with the barley. They grind the wheat up into flour and they make two loaves of bread. And I believe this is the only offering that's offered to God that has got yeast in it or leaven. Now you know the reason why there's no yeast in any of the flour offerings is because yeast is a symbol of sin. 
So how can we offer loaves baked with yeast, which is sin, and offer them to the Lord? Ellen White, when she comments on this, says that these loaves of bread were baked so, so thoroughly in the furnace that all the yeast died. And so it's a representation that the sin has died in these two loaves. So both of these loaves are a first fruit. They're both offered to God. So we've got, again, these two steps of the first fruits, one and two. But here the symbol is not Christ and men, but these are men whose lives have been, who have, whose, in their lives, sin has been eradicated. And it was eradicated before they were lifted up to God. So the sin was put out of their life before they're offered to God because they were put in an oven and the, and the yeast was burnt out. So we've got that symbology. We've got two witnesses. But that when we deal with the first fruit, the, it comes in two steps. First of all, there's Christ and these men. So there's two first fruit offerings. At Pentecost, there were two loaves. So we've got a doubling and a doubling. There's this both concept that there's two first fruits. So this is the primary logic to identify that in Adventism, there are going to be two groups of people. And we're going to explore a little bit about what those two groups are and how they look and what they look like. But there's the two groups, and both of them are the first fruit. And we get this concept from the imagery that I've just portrayed to you here. The first fruit offering um, at the beginning of the year, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and at Pentecost. So this is identifying where, the, where we get these three groups. So hopefully, I've given you enough information to accept that there are three groups, two in Adventism, one in the world. And those two groups in Adventism, they're represented as a singular man and many men. So there's this idea of numbers. You know that Christ was a priest, by the way. So here we have the symbol of the priest. He's the one that's offered first and then the men are offered because Christ goes to heaven first to see his father, to see if his sacrifice was accepted. He goes to heaven, then Brother Patrick told you that he came back down to earth, which was Mark in 9-11, and when he comes back down to earth and when he's going to go up the second time, he takes the men with him. So Christ, the priest, is the first in order and then the men. First Christ and the men. That's one symbol. And the other symbol we want to, we want to add to that is that there's two first fruits offering, but now we've got this concept that there was sin in their lives and it's been burnt out or eradicated. So when does this happen? It all happens at the harvest. So when you get these loaves that had sin in them, when was the sin taken out? Was it taken out here? Of course not, because here... The loaf is lifted up to God. The loaf was baked here in this time period from 9-11 to the harvest. This is where this bread was baked in a furnace and thoroughly tried and all the sin taken out of it and then it was lifted up at the harvest. So the point I want to make here primarily is that there are two groups in Adventism. So if we can see that, then the other thing that we want to point out is that there's an order. First Christ, then the men. So there's an order that when this harvest is going to happen. So it's going to happen in two stages. Stage one and stage two. They don't happen at the same time. So that's the, that's the two principles that I want us to see. That there's two first fruits from Adventism and they happen sequentially one after the other. Now as soon as you see that idea, then you can begin to open up this concept that when we think about this line and we're going to think about the harvest that's going on and we know that the harvest here is complete. So here's our two lows. Or the first fruits that we've, we've spoken about. Now if I put them all together here, it would infer that they both happen at the same time. But I've already indicated that there's a sequence. First Christ is offered, then the men. So we have the license 
to take this first fruit offering here, number one, and this is number two, and see that this first fruit offering is going to be offered before this, not at the same time. And we're going to see that this first fruit offering is actually offered here. So here's stage one of the first fruits, and this is stage two of the first fruits. I already spoke to you earlier that this is the theme of marriage or church. In fact, marriage and church are virtually the same thing. But let's think about this church. Now, the church is symbolised by a temple. There are various ways that we can think about this temple. One way to think about it is that there's this temple that's being built from 9-11 to the end. But we know the church is already in existence already. So we can think of it either as a building of a church, here it is building, or a cleansing of a church. Depending upon the image that you have, either the story talks about building a church, or another story talks about cleansing of a church. So we want to think about this story of the cleansing of a church. And we're going to go to... To discover that one, we're going to go to Second Chronicles, chapter 29. Second Chronicles, chapter 29, is dealing in the period of history when King Hezekiah is reigning. Most of us are familiar with King Hezekiah. He's the person who had a, a, some kind of a boil or infection on his leg. He was going to die. He prays to the Lord. Isaiah comes to him and says, put some figs on your wound and you're going to be healed. And then the, uh, the sun turned back a certain amount of degrees. Uh, so that's that story that most of us are familiar with. It's a children's story that we speak about often. In this story here, when King Hezekiah comes to the throne, his father, King Ahaz, has decimated the sanctuary. And he's going to now restore it or cleanse it. And in that story... It's 2 Chronicles 29, I think it's verses 15 to 16 or 15 to 17 that we'd go through. We're not going to go through the passages because we're running out of time, but I'm just directing you to them. It gives a story that the, how the sanctuary or the temple is going to be cleansed. And there are two groups of people that begin this work of cleansing. And the only people who can actually enter into this um, sanctuary are the priests and the Levites. <sighs> It introduces these two groups, these two names. Now we know that the priests are themselves Levites. So if I did sort of like a, a family tree of types, here's the Levite, this is the tribe, it would be split into two groups. You'd have the priests and you'd have the Levites. This is the house of Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother. From the family of Aaron come all the line of the priests. All the other sons of Levi, and he had a number of other sons, all of these different sons here were collectively known as the Levites, and they, their job function was to live off the tithe and to support the maintenance of the sanctuary. So that's the relationship between these two groups, between the priests and the Levites. These were the sons of Aaron, and these were the sons of Aaron's brothers, and they all come from the tribe of Levi. Now, in this sanctuary system, I'll draw a quick plan of it, here's the temple, and here's the courtyard with a wall around, with a wall around it. So all of this is the sanctuary service, or the sanctuary system, or complex. The priests are the only people who are allowed in the building, and the Levites are allowed in the courtyard. They're not allowed in the building itself to do any kind of ministration. Only the priest is allowed in there. So there's this relationship between the priest and the Levites, between the building and the courtyard. So in this story of Second Chronicles 29, it's going to talk about the cleansing of this temple. And it says that they began the work on the first day of the first month, and they finished this work on the 16th day of the first month. And then it talks about the work... There was, there's a stage in the work and it, it, it identifies it occurring on the eighth day of the first month. And what's being portrayed here is that the, this temple complex begins to be cleaned on the first day of the first month 
and first it's the temple and then the second stage is the courtyard so this is the court and this is the temple building and it does it in this sequence or this order so first the priests and then the Levites are going to cleanse the temple so when we think about these two groups here the first roots the symbol that we're using that we draw from this Old Testament story some identification symbols that we're going to have which is connected with the temple or the church here is we're going to identify these two groups as the priests and the Levites and we take that straight out of the story of Second Chronicles first the priests then the Levites it's in that sequence first the temple then the courtyard the priests are doing the work then the Levites are doing the work now if you know anything about the the sanctuary service and the way the feast works you would know that there's something significant about the 16th day of the first month because we know that the 14th day of the first month is Passover when Jesus was crucified then he rested on the 15th which was that Sabbath rest and then he resurrected on Sunday which was the 16th and Sunday the 16th was the day that you had the first fruit so let's look at this story it takes them 16 days to clean the temple by the time you, by the time you get here the temple is clean indicating there's no sin but eight days before that let me put let me put it this way I won't put the temple I'll put the sanctuary complex was all clean by the 16th day and the temple itself was clean on the 8th day so the temple is already ready on the 8th and it takes another 8 days to clean the courtyard and get it all finished so here are these two cleans it's clean here and it's clean here and by the time you get to the 16th now you're into the first fruit situation and on the first fruit we've already identified as being here so here you've got Sunday law which is marked here in this story by the 16th day of the first month it's probably escaped your attention because I only briefly mentioned this when we went to the story of Ezra but the first day of the first month is the 19th of April 1844 we already mentioned that but it probably went over your head and April the 19th 1844 lines up with 9-11 the first day of the first month so here we have 9-11 and what you can see is now that we've constructed a reform line from the story of 2nd Chronicles 29 which is identical to our reform line 9-11 to the Sunday law and right here on the eighth day of the first month you see something's been cleaned and this lines up with the midnight cry so what we've just developed and we've gone through this really quickly is that we've developed a reform line of Adventism at the end of the world which is composed of two groups of people the priests and the Levites and these two groups are symbolized in these two first fruit offerings remember I said earlier that here's your two first fruits one and two but Christ is offered first and then the other men but there are these two groups this is identifying why I put the first one over here and I took it away from here from the story of Second Chronicles because you see the priests here are clean and here you see the Levites are clean because the priests and the Levites then become symbols themselves of the cleansing of this temple because this is a physical temple in this literal story but it becomes a symbolic temple at the end of the world and that symbolic temple becomes a symbol of these men who are priests who are fully cleaned by the midnight cry and they become the first fruit offering that are offered to God here then there's another work in Adventism which is the work of the Levites who finished their cleaning work by the 16th day 
by the Sunday law and this cleansing of the courtyard becomes a symbol of the cleansing of these men and here you have the second first fruit offerings. So by the time you come to the 16th day you have two loaves and two sets of sheaves. Both have been offered by the time you get to the 16th but they happen in these two steps. So this is how we develop the argument to say that there are two steps in Adventism, first the priest and then the Levites. So if all of that makes sense, hopefully it does even though we've gone through it very quickly, it should be troubling to you and the reason why it should be troubling is because I'm saying we're here in 2016, 15 years after 9-11, 2016 and the next event to come is going to be midnight and then midnight cry and then the Sunday law and if you are in the category here of the priests so hopefully you've got most of this down I'm going to have to rub some of this off from here to here this is the story of the priests here are the priests and we're going to see in a minute that from here to here is the story of the Levites there's this overlap and I'll explain that as we go along first the priests then the Levites you can see that the third step here's the third step for the priests when they're lifted up here is happening before you get to Sunday law so if you're a priest, your probation will close when I say long, I don't mean in the sense of years or time but it will close with events wise long before the Sunday law and it's these priests who are going to be offered up as an ensign or a first fruits that are going to be the mechanism by which the Lord is going to draw these Levites into this movement, into this message to prepare to do a work at the Sunday Law for this group of people outside here which we identify to be the world. This is new light. This has only been understood in the last 12 months or so. Most of Adventism, if they understood anything about the First Fruits offerings, would have realised or understood that the First Fruits are offered at Sunday Law who are a representation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church who are going to do a work of calling out God's people out of the world whether you identify them as Edom, Moab and Ammon from Daniel 11 verse 41 or from Revelation 18 verse 4 or from the Gospel story that talks about these 11th hour workers they're all symbols of the same group of people we've understood that Adventism is going to do that work here at the Sunday Law period but now we can see through these prophetic lines that it's more complicated than that that in Adventism there are two groups and not only these two groups but the first group is going to be ready and prepared for these events at this period here which to simplify it is the midnight cry by the time you get to the midnight cry from 9-11 to the Sunday law the priests are ready and what I mean by ready is that they have been harvested and the harvesting of these priests when they get lifted up and raised in the ensign here's this first fruit offering their role or their job function in life is to go to these Levites and tell them to prepare for the soon coming Sunday law there are a number of different stories to um, uh, that agree and bolster this story that we've mentioned here just to take you to one more this is in the story or the book of Ezra let's turn to the book of Ezra because these are only a few verses book of Ezra chapter 7 we've spoken about this building that's being constructed here now to get a building to run you need certain people everybody knows that to get a facility to work you need people behind it that make sure it works 
Now, when you come to the sanctuary, you don't just need priests and Levites. There are another group of people that you need. It takes three groups of people to get a functioning sanctuary system. And in the book of Ezra, it's going to identify these three groups of people. So, we're in Ezra... Did I give you the chapter, Ezra chapter 7? Ezra chapter 7, verse 7. There went up, just to give you the background of this, this is the return of the exiles from Babylon. Ezra's got the third decree, this is the decree of Artaxerxes in his seventh year, explains that all in the book of um, um, the book of Ezra. And in verse 7 it says the following, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests and the Levites, and of the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. They begin their journey, in verse 9 it says, on the first day of the first month. Look, here it is, the first day of the first month. They begin the journey at 9-11, and they're travelling through Jerusalem. Well, you can mark, if you went back to verse 8, it says, and they came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which is the seventh year of Artaxerxes. The fifth month is being marked right here at the midnight cry. This would be the first day of the fifth month, the tenth day of the seventh month, and the first day of the first month. But the point I want us to pick up from this is that the, in verse 7 it tells you who's going to be part of this work. It says the priests, here's the priests that we've spoken about, then it says the Levites, then it introduces the third group. The, by the way, those singers and porters are just Levites. They're not separate groups, so just include them with the Levites. The third group, it calls them Nethanims. So here are the Nethanims. Now if you go to uh, chapter 8, just turn over one chapter, and we're looking at verse 20, it's going to tell you a little bit about who the Nethanims are. It says, Also of the Nethanims whom David and the princes had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanims, all of them expressed by name. So these Nethanims, it says, are the servants... of the Levites. Now if you do a bit of research on who these Nethanims are, you'll see that they are not Jews. These are Jews, Hebrews, priests and the Levites, obviously. No one's allowed to minister in the sanctuary except this group of people. But there's another group, these Nethanims, who are press ganged into service to help the Levites do the work and their job function in life is to draw the water and to cut and uh, deliver the wood. So they're dealing with the water and the wood and these are not Jews. So when you have a fully functioning sanctuary system you need three groups, not just two, the priests, the Levites and the Nethanims. And these three groups, one, two, three, are the same groups that we're identifying here. One, two, three. So you have the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanims. The Nethanims are identified either as Nethanims in this story, 11th hour workers, the threefold union, Edom, Moab, and Ammon from Daniel 11. There are also the ten tribes that I mentioned to you from Ezekiel 37, those ten tribes that were scattered. And I think that's it. You have these different symbols of the same group of people, but this is the other evidence from the book of Ezra to show you that there are these three groups and this is, all of this is based around the model of the sanctuary system. There are a number of other structures that you'd need to understand to really be confirmed and established in this truth. So just in closing, we just want to go through Amos chapter 9 and just work out the intricacies of what's going on here you can see I've got an overlap between the priests and the Levites and we're going to explain how that overlapping works. So, Amos chapter 9. 
verse 9. We're on page 9 of your notes. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. This sifting or shaking is the shaking that we mention here. It's this punishment, and Ellen White says, it's already begun way back here. When the test began, the shaking had begun. That's why we had we placed a hold here to restrain this shaking. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say that evil shall not overtake or prevent us. You can put a pe pencil note in your, um, in your notes here. When it talks about this evil shall not overtake us, this is Isaiah chapter 28. This is the leadership in the church, the scornful men who rule Jerusalem, who say when the overwhelming scourge shall come, we are going to escape death. But this passage clearly tells you, and it tells you in Isaiah 28, that you're not going to escape death. All the sinners, the people who are committing sin, are going to be dying by the sword. In that day, will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. So you can see here, it talks about the tabernacle of David. Now a tabernacle is a tent or a building. It's talking about the construction of the temple. So it's telling you that the temple of David, which we often call Solomon's temple, that's fallen down and broken up, is now going to be rebuilt. And in your notes, I've got a reference to Acts chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. And it, this... Acts chapter 15 and 16 and 17 is a repeat of the passage from Amos 9. So we're going to read what it says in verse 16. Verse 16 lines up with Amos 9, 11. After this will I return and build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. So what we're identifying is from 9, 11 to the Sunday law, the building or the construction of a temple. That's, that's what's being identified in these words. Now we're in Amos 9, verse 12. And this is the reason why it's being built up. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth these things. The clearest way to actually see this passage is if we read Acts chapter 15, verse 17. It's parallel in verse 12, so I'm going to go back to verse 17. It's a clearer language. It says the reason is this. The reason why the tabernacle is going to be built, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles, Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. So here... We've got a few bricks here, and these bricks are going to be built or constructed into a temple. Here's our temple, the Tabernacle of David. And the reason why this is being constructed, the first reason it says that the residue of men, the word residue means remnant. And these men that it's dealing with are the remnant of Adventism. So the purpose for this building is that these remnants from Adventism can go and live inside this tabernacle or reside there and worship God. And the second reason, so that's one, is that the Gentiles can do the same. But it's not any old Gentiles, it says the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. This is Revelation 18 verse 4. This is Ezra 8, verse 20. This is these Nethanim. This is the ten tribes of Ephraim. From Ezra, chapter 37. We didn't go to the verses that deal with this, but you'll, talk, we'll, you'll see um, it uses the terminology of these sticks. But I did give you the overview of this, the separation that goes on, these ten tribes that are scattered, who are going to come back and join God's people. The ones who are called Israel, the ten tribes of Israel. It says here, that upon whom my name is called. These people who call upon the name of the Lord are the ones who are going to go back and they're going to live in this temple. So here you've got these groups of people living in this temple. Now the thing is, 
this temple isn't just some building that you go and live in. We already identified that this temple itself is a symbol of what? People. Here are all these people. So I'm going to redo this graphic in the following way. Here's our line. And we're going to just do three steps. We've got 9-11, Midnight Cry, Sunday Law, and the close of probation. By the midnight cry here, the priests are ready. This was the eighth day of the first month. So here, this temple is ready for habitation. And here are the priests, they're living in this temple. In fact, the priests are the temple. When they're lifted up and they're going to be doing the work, here's the priests, they're going to be doing work for the Levites. If I can use it in this terminology, they're going to put an extension on the building. And then you're going to have the priest and the Levites. So this temple becomes bigger. So here the priests are doing a work for the Levites. And then the Levites are going to be doing work for the 11th hour workers. And so this house is going to get even bigger. And now you've got the priests, the Levites and the 11th hour workers. This is this development or growth or progressive ceiling that's going on as this house gets progressively bigger. It starts small and it keeps on growing. This is the tabernacle of David that the Lord is raising up that was fallen all the way back here. And this fallenness is the state of Adventism right back in this history or the experience of Laodicea, this group of people who have fallen. So we read up to verse 12, we're in Amos chapter 9, now we're in verse 13. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that the ploughman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And then it says, And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, they shall plant vineyards, and it goes on. This term when it says, bring again, is identifying that God's people are going to, who are already in captivity, are going to be brought out of captivity so that they can rebuild the waste places. You remember when we looked at Luke 21, 21, and it says, when you see the sign, flee from Jerusalem. And I identified the fleeing of Jerusalem was, in its end time application, that we're supposed to flee from the idolatry or the wrong doctrinal um, concepts that are full and rampant in our church. And this is what's being brought for you here. It says, and I will bring again, or I will return, Israel who are captive in Babylon. We are captive in Babylon because we've got so many of the ideas and the principles from Babylon alive and well in our church. And we need to escape them. And that's what it says here. He's going to free his people, these priests and then the Levites, who are held captive by these strange doctrines. And then obviously we know the 11th hour workers are actually bodily in Babylon and they're going to be escaping out of Babylon as well. So there's this escaping out of Babylon that's going on here. We are not Babylon. Adventism is not Babylon, but we've taken on many of their belief systems and we need to flee and escape from them. So that's what that passage is saying. And... In the final few moments, I just want to lay out how we address this issue that we just read when it said, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that the ploughman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. So you can see that there's this overlapping work that's doing, that's, sorry, that's occurring. It says, the ploughman shall overtake the reaper. So even though we may not be able to conceptualise exactly what that looks like, you can see that there's this overlapping. So when you saw that I took the priests up to here, and I took the Levites beginning here, that there was this overlap, this is what's being um, portrayed in this verse from Amos chapter 9, this issue of overlapping. So I want to try and visualise uh, for our benefit how are we going to lay this on a line? So at 9-11, we said that there was a former rain. So here's the former rain. And then we said, here it is, 
there's a latter rain just before the harvest. That former rain is the time where you sow seeds. So here's this seed sowing. These are both happen at these way marks, as we've seen. This is the time of ploughing. This is the time of growing. And this is the time of the harvest. I'll put it in the terms of Hosea, which is reaping. So you can see that here, the work or the everlasting gospel for the priests is complete. Now we identified that first the priests are going to be the first fruit offerings and then the Levites. So you know that the Levites have to follow this same sequence of events but they're going to have their experience at a later date. So we just want to uh, put that in place. Now this latter rain that's being poured out to ripen the priests ready for the harvest or this reaping stage is going to be the same rain but this is going to be identified as the former rain this is the former rain and then you're going to have seed sowing and now we're talking about the story for the Levites as I've just said what happens before you sow seed you need to plough here's the ploughing once the seed is sown it's going to grow and once the growth has been accomplished, then you need a latter rain. And once the latter rain has done its work, then you'll reap. And this is the story of the Levites. You can see here, at Sunday Lord, the Levites are ready to be lifted up as the first fruit. And you can see here, by the time you've got to the midnight cry, the priests have been reaped and they're ready here to be lifted up as an ensign. So you have the first fruits and the first fruits. Now we think about the work of the world. So often when we think about the world, we think everything's going to happen back here after the Sunday law. But you can already see that's not going to be the case. This latter rain that's going to be poured out at midnight cry is going to be the rain that these 11th hour workers are going to receive when the seed is going to be planted in their hearts and then before the Sunday law not after but before the Sunday law they're going to grow and then there's going to be the latter rain and then they're going to be reaped in the time period where we classically place them but before the growth comes the ploughing. And this is the line or the story for the 11th hour workers. This line where we talk about the reaping for the 11th hour workers is nothing new in Adventism. This is what you will read in the Great Controversy. This latter rain that I've put here is the latter rain that most people understand is going to be poured out at the Sunday law that's going to do this work. This is where we think about the loud cry. But what we've not understood in Adventism is all of this work that goes on before it. Now if you look at the scale of things, how much work is being done here? It's just this small amount of work and all of this preparatory information or experience needs to all have been accomplished before you can ever get to here. So, how we think as Adventists, we're going to be participating in this work when we never understood any of this, beggars belief. You can see the complexity and yet the simplicity of this message. At one level it is really simple, but at another level it's quite... It's, it's, to me it's really beautiful to behold. So you can see the reaping of the priests, the Levites and the eleventh hour workers. If we drop this down into a single event, all of this 
is the third angel's message because it's the reaping of the priests, the reaping of the Levites and the reaping of the eleventh hour workers. So this reaping or the work of the third angel comes in three stages, one, two, three. And here, this is the work of the first and second angel's messages. But it's not as simple as that because when the work of the first and second angel's messages are going on here, here's the first and second angel's messages, which is the growth, is going to be the same as the first and second angel's messages for the Levites here, and then the first and second angel's messages for the eleventh hour workers here. There's much, much more we could say about this. It has many implications about how we're supposed to conduct ourselves, what's going on in our church, what your role is in the church, what your role is not in the church. I just want to close with one last comment. All of us are sitting in this room listening and learning this information. Now you were not here by accident. The Lord brought you here for a reason. At one level, I don't know why he chose you, but he did. But I do know one thing. The fact that you're here in 2016 places you in the period for the priests. Because you are not being ploughed. You are being given a message that teaches you how to grow. You're now being taught the first and second angel's messages. You can see that the Levites in this history are not being taught the first and second angel's messages. They'll realise or have an experience of it in this time period here. The fact that we're talking about the first and second angel's messages and you're listening to this puts you fairly and squarely in this group of people, the priests. And that means that your probation is about to close in this time period from midnight to midnight cry in this harvest, not in this time period here, in this harvest, because this is the reaping or the harvest of the Levites, and this is the reaping or the harvest for the priests. And you being here qualifies you for this, to be part of this group. Now there's swings and roundabouts in everything, and even though you may think, oh, I've got less time than I thought, one thing that you should find comfort in, it's far easier to be a priest than it is a Levite. It's far easier to be a priest. And the reason why I say that is because the time period that we've got to settle into the truth is much longer than the time period that the Levites have got to settle into the truth. This growth period here is going to be extremely rapid. They've only got a short amount of time, in the English we say, you know, to get your act together. And then when it comes to the 11th hour workers, when they are going to go through their growth period, they're going to be going through a period here when they're growing where the earth is going to be crumbling economically. They're going to be in such turmoil, it's going to be so hard for them. The people who've got it the easiest is you and I. So, with those encouraging words, hopefully, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, may it be the prayer of each and every one of us that we come before you with thankful hearts. There are so many people you could have chosen, but from the days of eternity you decided to identify us, that we would be here in this movement at this period in Earth's history. Lord, we don't question why, but we thank you that we can be part of that group. Father, it's left to each and every one of us to decide whether we will be wise priests or foolish priests. But what has been taken away from us is our choice of being a priest or a Levite or an eleventh hour worker. We thank you, Lord, that you chose us to be your priests. It's my prayer that each and every one of us rises up to the challenge of accepting that badge of honour of being a wise priest. Fathers, we consider the fearful end of someone who is foolish. We know that intellectually none of us would want to experience that. And yet it's your testimony that many of us will. 
because we don't enter into a spiritual experience with you. Help us, Father, to deal with the sin problem in our life. Help us to begin to grapple with the consequences of the world that we face. Lord, you know our struggles, our difficulties. We have family situations that we cannot deal with. We know that you expect things from us. We know that you want us to draw away from the world, to leave the cities and to move, to move into the country. Father, we know that that's a requirement. Help us to, first of all, be convicted on this issue and then find a way of escape for us. Father, there are many things we need to do to come into agreement and come into line that we might participate in this reformatory movement. May this day, this Holy Convocation, this weekend, be the beginning of a, a real and true reformation in our lives from which we will never turn back. Lord, I know that there are people in this congregation to whom all of these things are new. May you be with them and give them comfort. May they not be, may be, may they not be overwhelmed by the, the mass of information, but may they go away with a very clear understanding, even though they don't realise and know the details of what you are calling them to be. Father, help us and bless us. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.